So we're looking at Frederick Winslow Taylor's Principles of Scientific Management. And in this particular video, we're going to focus on that second bullet point, which is separating out the planning function from the actual work activity. So if Taylor's finding the one best way to do things, we need to plan out the process, the steps, in order to make our good or provide our services. And so where we see this planning function uh, today and as we progress through history is in looking at process design. How long do activities take? What activities need to be done? And so we look at the contribution of Henry Gantt. He was a US mechanical engineer and he saw the role of management to eliminate chance and accidents. That is, we need to look at what a worker should do and what they actually do. Compare that to the amount of work that needs to be done. And so Henry Gantt is famous for the Gantt chart that we use today in operations management uh, and in project management. So this is what a Gantt chart looks like. We have our activities here, and this example looks at building a hockey arena. And then you have our bars here across time. So what this shows you is that first we need to do a preliminary survey. That's going to take two weeks. And then we can do site selection and design development, and those can happen at the same time. And we see they take uh, from week two to, what is that, week seven. So a Gantt chart shows us the activities, and it shows us how long something is going to take. And so we can also look then in terms of of somewhat in terms of the order of the process. So you see preliminary surveys come first, hiring the contractor comes at the end. We can also build what is called a process flow diagram. So the process flow diagram also shows the activities or steps in the process, but it focuses on what decisions need to be made what input do we need from others? When do we need to get materials? So in a process flow diagram has some common shapes. We start the diagram with a circle and end with a circle. We also can use circles to indicate that we are moving to a new process flow diagram for a separate process. Anything that is an activity, so something that we do, comes as a square. Anything that is a decision is a diamond. And we can branch off of that diamond when different decisions or how we answer the question, what decision we make, uh, results in different activities. So we'll see that in just a moment. If we are pulling materials from storage, we use a triangle. And if we need input from others, we use a parallelogram. Because process flow diagrams can be used to determine where the production process is most at risk, or in quality management where the quality is most at risk, we can also flag within our process flow diagram potential failure points. So I'll link to a video here where we do some process flow diagramming in operations management. There's a video there that goes into a bit more detail than we're gonna discuss here. Today for our intro management class, we'll skip the potential failure point component since we're focused really here on that process as we look at methods, best are there best methods for how to do things. So here's an example of a process flow diagram. All right, I wanna look at the process for doing lunch plans. So an activity is I'm going to review the menus and I'm going to decide on the place we're gonna order from. So decisions are diamonds, and if I can't find a place that I like, you can see that it goes back to reviewing the menus. If I can find a place that I like, then I need to get my friend's order. So you can see it's a parallelogram since I need information from someone else. So my friend tells me what they want to eat for lunch, and then I decide from that same place what I'm going to have. If there's nothing on that menu that I want, then I go back to reviewing the menus, then I decide on a place, then my friend can decide on what they want from that place. So you can see the process flow. We're going back in the diagram as um, based on only the decision. So you can see the splits 
uh, in the flow happen at the decisions. Once we've decided on an order, then I place the order. So that's going to be a square. Uh, and then I pay. Then I wait for food to arrive. And then that gives us food to eat. So you can see it's the steps in the process. We can see where we need to make decisions. We can see where we need input from others. If I needed to pull, let's say after I wait for the food to arrive, I'm going to pull a, a fork and spoon from the drawer. Then I would add in my triangle to show that I pulled um, the fork and spoon from storage and that's an input. So these are the steps in the process, highlighting where we need input and where we make decisions. This one's a pretty simple process flow diagram. You can get a lot more complicated. Uh, so this is the process flow diagram for making macaroni and cheese. The key with a process flow diagram is really to emphasize every decision that is being made. If you were to hire someone to do this for you, then they need to know what is it that is simply a step. They do this. And then what is it where they need to, to check, where they need to see if something is ready to move forward, whether they need to make a decision. Often when it comes to processes, right, it's all in our head, it's all very automatic. We don't even realize we're making decisions when we do very routine activities. So when you make macaroni and cheese, your response might be, okay, well, I turn the water on, I get it to boil, I throw in the noodles. When the noodles are uh, cooked, I add in the cheese sauce, mix it up, and I eat it. No decisions there, right? But in fact, there's a lot of decisions that are in that process, which is how much water do I put into the pot? Um, is it boiling? And is it done? How much cheese sauce do I add? Is it lumpy? Should I keep stirring? These are all decisions that we don't even realize that we make. Uh, and so part of the process flow diagram is really to get us to think about all of the decisions that we are making. And if you were handing this off to someone else to do in your absence, you would really need to recognize the fact that they need to know these things, right? They need to know what is lumpy and what is not. What is boiling, what is not. Uh, how much water is okay and what is not. Things that we just do automatically. So here we have our process flow diagram. So we've looked at Gantt charts. We've looked at process flow diagrams. There is another type of chart that we can look at as we look at the process. Remember in uh, scientific management under Taylor, we are separating out the planning from the doing. And so all of these charts are related to planning. So the Gantt chart showed us the activities and what happened at what time. The process flow diagram showed us the steps and where the decisions are. The last chart we're gonna look at here is what is called a PERT chart. So this is a program evaluation and review technique, also called a precedence network. So the key here with these types of charts is it shows you which activity comes before which activity and the dependency of the activities to each other. So which ones have to be completed before you can do the next step? So what, in terms of precedence, we're talking about what comes before, okay? Now, these slides go into a lot of detail in terms of how precedence networks and PERT charts work. In intro management, we're not gonna do these calculations, we're not gonna build these or analyze these. We simply need to know that these exist and what they are. If you want more information about how to use a PERT chart, how to set up that precedence network, there is a link to the video here um, for operations management. In the third year of our program, uh, you'll dive deeper into this. But right now, we just need to know they exist. So I'm not going to go into all the details that you see uh, in these slides. And in fact, if you look at, you can see here, in terms of the calculations that go with these, what we're looking at is what happens when activities are not an exact amount of time, what happens when they can vary in terms of the amount of time. So we have optimistic and pessimistic estimations of time. How does that impact then when your project is completed? We'll do that in operations management. You can see more of that in the video linked um, to this picture here. Our focus really for this class 
is that when we look at a precedence network or a PERT chart, we have a list of activities, the time they take, and we identify what the predecessor is, what came before. So according to this, this is our example just that we saw before in terms of the hockey arena. The first thing you do is carry out a needs analysis or a survey. And then comes B, determine location for hockey arena. So notice the predecessor is A. Before you can do B, you have to first do A. Notice also that C, develop the preliminary design, does not depend on B. So we ha don't have to determine the location before we start working on the design. We can start working on the design at the same time as we're looking for a location but we can't develop a design until after the needs analysis. So if you are creating a precedence network, it would look something like this, where you can see A happens first. Let me just pull out my pen here. So A happens first, and then we can see that B depends on A, so B can't happen until A happens, and C depends on A. So C can't happen until A happens. But notice that C does not depend on B. They can happen concurrently, so at the same time. When we do precedence networks, one of the things we're looking at when it comes to this precedence network is how long these activities take compared to each other and when this project could be done. So let's assume, for example, that activity B, and I know it doesn't because we just looked at it in the previous slides, but let's assume activity B takes eight months to do. And let's assume that activity C takes two months and activity D takes one month. So when we are looking at how long it takes to finish this arena, we recognize we have to do all of these steps, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. But we recognize that some of these can be done concurrently at the same time. So we talked about how B and C can be done concurrently at the same time, which means the total time of the project doesn't come from adding eight months to two months to one month to all the other numbers. We can finish it in less time because we can do some of the activities at the same time. So we find what is called a critical path. The critical path will tell us the earliest we can finish this project. And the critical path is the route that takes the longest time. Because if we still have to do everything to finish the project, it's that longer route that is going to slow us down. So notice here in the first phase, so if we look at the left side of this graph here, activity B takes eight months. Activity C and D take two and one. So activity B is going to be part of the critical path because that part takes the longest. We can do C and D while we're waiting for B, while B is being done. And so it is the time it takes for B that's gonna impact the finish time because we gotta get all the way through the eight month part B activity, okay? We also, when we look at a precedence network, we look for what is called slack. Some of your activities will have slack. Anything on the critical path has no slack. This is going to take the longest time, so we need to know exactly when to start it and exactly when to finish it if we're gonna hit the target completion date. But activities like C and D have slack. We know that because they're not on the critical path, and the next activity, E, requires that B be done and C and D be done. If we're doing C and D at the same time we're doing B, then notice that C and D collectively are only going to take three months to do, but B takes eight months. So there's a lot of slack when it comes to C and D. We could start them at the same time as B, and then C and D are done three months in, and B still has five months more of work to go before we can start E. So C and D have slack. We could instead wait. We could wait a couple months. We start B, C and D are on hold, and then we start them in the middle of the work on B. So C and D have slack. They can move around in terms of when we start them, when we finish them, 
because they're all happening at the same time as B is moving through its eight month process. When it comes to activities that have slack, there's also the ability for these activities to take longer than expected without impacting the final date at which this project is done. Those activities that are on the critical path, the route that takes the longest, if activity B takes any more than eight months, that's going to change your finish date because there's no slack. There's no extra wiggle room uh, for activity B to take any longer because it's the part that takes the longest through there. So what you need to know in intro management is as we are planning how to do something, we have what is called a precedence network or a perp chart, which shows the dependency of activity. So E can't happen until B, C, and D happen. C depends on A happening, but not on B. We also need to know the idea of a critical path. So as we take time to figure out how much this activity, this whole project takes to do, the activities that are on the critical path have no slack and determine the final date in which the project is due. Activities that are not on the critical path have slack and we have flexibility in terms of when we start and finish them. So we're separating out the planning from the doing with the Gantt chart, with the process flow diagram, with our PERT charts or precedence networks. So if you're working along with us on our gingerbread diagram, or sorry, our gingerbread uh, houses, what we wanna do is create a process flow diagram. So what are the steps to build a gingerbread house? We have our crackers here. We have our candy decorations here. We ultimately want to end up with a house. So what are the activities? What are the decisions that need to be made? Uh, create that process flow diagram. And then as we look at that process flow diagram, which activities could be done concurrently? So if you think about a perk chart or a precedence network, that actually shows us that some of these activities could be done at the same time. We're not asking you here to create a precedence network or PERT chart, but simply to flag the activities that if we had more than one person working on this project, we could be doing some of these activities at the same time. 